morning. Welcome, 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 welcome to WOP's Tuesday morning women's Bible study here at Bethel Christian Center. Yes. We're so glad that you're joining us and we have good news. Well, we're always bringing the good news <laughs> of the word, but... Bible study is officially back open. Yes. <laughs> you know, we've been given permission, the church to be back open, and so is our Tuesday morning Bible study, ladies. So those who were coming when we had opened and then the closed and you're back at home, I just want to invite you to come. We still have our social distancing. We still have you wearing masks. Um, because of our school being open, when you come on the campus, your temperature will be taken as well as wearing a mask. Um, once you are sitting in the sanctuary, you know, with the social distancing, you can take your mask off if you like, or you can keep it on. But we're just praising God that we are able to have our ladies come back in. We have water, coffee. We have individually wrapped pastries. Yes. So we're not at the place where we're making food again and we're not sitting around at the tables, but we are sitting in. And so just want to invite you to come and yes. join in with us and be <clears throat> able to see and to ask permission if you could give a hug or an elbow. That's fine, you know, but we know that there is a difference when you're up close yes. and personal and when you're able to be a part of one another's lives. God created us to be in relationship. Yes. He created us for connection. That's we're right. called the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he made us so that we're able to have that input and in encouraging one another up close and personal as well. You know, as Pastor Rhonda always says, there's no coronavirus here. That's and someone right. may think, well, you guys are really, really arrogant to think you can say that. <laughs> what makes you think that you're a protected in that way. It's because we know what God's word exactly. says. Exactly. And it's okay. You know, because one thing I realized, Mandy, that is really amazing. And I know, you know, in the beginning of this, there was a lot of mass wars and people upset that you don't wear a mask. You should wear a mask. How dare you? And you Christians, you just don't care. And it's not that we respect one another. I right. wear a mask everywhere I go out in public because I do respect and honor other people. But I want to share this with you as well. We are all growing, even as Christians, we are all at different phases and levels in believing of the word of God. I, I wanna use this example because this came to me one day because I was like, Lord, you know it's really something because many times as humans, we try to bring everybody down to where we are. Exactly. Or we think that everybody thinks the way we think, or we think that we have arrived and where we believe mm -hmm. is, the, is the top of it and there's no more to <laughs> learn or grow. See, all of those things come in play with the unrenewed mind. So I remember many years ago, I heard Kenneth Hagin sharing along the lines of, you know, because the faith movement was coming and God was giving revelation on how to live by faith, how to believe the word of God, how to see the desires of our heart of the word being fulfilled. And so there was, of course, extremes, name it and claim it kind of things, people taking the word when they didn't even know the word, weren't in the word, but just acting on what someone else said and not really in relationship with the Lord for themselves. So when it didn't work, they began to persecute us say that word of faith stuff doesn't work. Those bunch of people are just naming it and claiming it. They're just trying to get stuff from God. Yes. And so that goes extreme. But I remember one day I heard him say, he says this, if you like, and there's no offense if you drive a Volkswagen, it's totally okay. <laughs> but what he was saying is, if you believe and you like a Volkswagen and that's where you want to stay want. at, he would say, don't, don't accuse me or persecute me because I'm driving or I like a Mercedes. Now listen to this, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, you know, I know many people, you know, have said, no, I'm not living in fear and we need to use wisdom and we do. But here's something that people need to know too. Because we are at different phases and stages in our relationship with the Lord. Exactly. And because there are different people that have revelation, more so than someone else may have a revelation of your identity, of who you, you are, are in Christ, yes. because of the word of God being alive in your life and you have seen the word proven, it's, it's a matter of because we're growing, then the bottom line is this, is that there are Christians who really are able to believe and walk in the word of God, knowing the covenant of God, then no plague will come nigh my dwelling. That's right. 
Do, do, because you think about this, to say that we're in a world that is full and has fallen with sin and sickness and disease, but Jesus, God Almighty already wrote in his word way back in Psalms 91, that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God and abide under the shadow. Do you know the shadow that we abide under now is the Lord Jesus Christ? We're not running to dwell in a secret place like that. That we, we are in the secret place. We are hidden in Christ Jesus. That's right. He is Amen. our redemption. He was made the curse in Galatians 3.13. The Bible says he absorbed the curse and he paid the penalty for the curse. Yes. Well, what was the curse? Sickness and disease, poverty and lack and eternal death. He made, God made Jesus the curse. He took it. He paid it. He absorbed it. And the, pen, the penalty and the punishment for them breaking the curse was death, sickness, and disease. Go read Deuteronomy 28. It tells you what the penalty was for the curse. Mm -hmm. And even in Deuteronomy 28, it says in every sickness and disease that's not even written in there is part of the curse. So then what happened was in Galatians 3.13, it says that Jesus was made the curse for, for us, us yes. in his own body so that the blessing of Abraham mm -hmm. would come on Never the Gentiles yes. and the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's it. But then it goes on to say in 13, Amen. for it is written, mm. cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. <laughs> And that was Jesus. The cross was made out of wood that came from a tree. And that was what was written in the law. And he hung on the tree. He hung on the cross. Yes. And when he was on that cross, God laid the whole world's sins on him. And when he was beaten and the stripes that were upon him before he even went to the cross was to obtain our healing. That's yes. why Matthew 8, 17, it says, for he... Jesus, right? He bare, he took our iniquities, our sins. And then it says, he bare our diseases. And the verses before this says, so that it might be fulfilled, spoken by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53, where it starts in 3, 4, and 5, where surely he has born. You know the word surely in that verse means without a doubt, with certainty. That's wow. what the Hebrew word says. Amen. He has born. He has removed. Yes. He has taken, carried, and it says our griefs and sorrows, but then Isaiah is saying our sicknesses and diseases in the Greek word. So back in the Isaiah, well, back in Isaiah 53, in the Hebrew, you look it up and it says, he has born, removed, carried, took away oh, our sicknesses. Thank you, Jesus. And then it says, and he carried all of our pain. And then it says, we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God. And then the next verse says, for he was mm. wounded. And the word wounded in the Hebrew means he was pierced. Yes. He was pierced for our transgressions. And then the word says he was bruised. The word bruised in the Hebrew means he was broken. He was crushed. He was mutilated mm. for our iniquities. And then the next verse says, for the chastisement of our peace needed the oh penalty paid gosh. for for our peace was upon <laughs> yes. him and with his stripes you are healed that's Isaiah 53 and then Matthew quotes Isaiah in Matthew 8 17 himself took our infirmities and bear our diseases yes. that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by Isaiah the prophet mm. many many years before mm. Jesus came Amen. And if you read the verses leading up to Matthew 8, 17, it shows Jesus going into Peter's house. And it says that Peter's mother-in-law laid sick with a fever and Jesus goes over to her and touches her. Mm. And immediately, immediately she was the healed. fever leaves <laughs> and she gets up and starts serving. And then it says they brought unto him many who were possessed with devils <laughs> and he cast them out with a word. Ooh. And it says and all who were sick that they brought, they were all healed. Glory oh be 
to God. Goodness, That's am. why Matthew said that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet yes. Isaiah. Himself took our infirmities and bare our diseases. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, and Jesus. And then Peter goes over in 1 mm. Peter. And he begins to say, he bare our sins in his own body, mm -hmm. hanging on the tree. Wow. Like this. Think about it. By whose stripes you and I were healed. healed. Past mm -hmm. tense. Amen. So as a believer, as a child of God, as a Christian, and the word of God being deposited to renew our mind. Yes of who we are and the finished work of Jesus and what he has done and what belongs to you and taking a hold of that, of that revelation of Holy Spirit bringing understanding of what you have now, yes. not what you're going to get, what belongs to you now. now. It changes the mindset when the soul is being renewed in that area to know, wait a minute, <laughs> he already paid for my healing. He already paid the price. Jesus already suffered it. He was already made a curse. He already endured it. He already bore it. He already, he already took it. It was it. all put on him already for me. If he already suffered and paid the price, because we know Jesus never sinned. So he didn't do it for himself. He did it because he loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Hallelujah. that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but I came to save the world. I'm not mad at you. I love you. I want you. I'm for mm. you. And I'm for your spirit, yeah. soul, and body being in health and wholeness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not just waiting till we get to heaven. No, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it in abundance. That means in your spirit, you're born of God, and as he is, so are you. But he also, I, think, I mean, it's just amazing. <laughs> so I'm saying all that to say, it's okay where you are, and God loves us where we are, but don't try to make everybody else fit. Mm -hmm because of just where you're believing at right now. Right. No more than me trying to tell you, well, you ought to know this, and you ought to be doing <laughs> no. no, because it's a process. It is a and process. And we're growing. But don't let where you are try to persecute and bring doubt to where another Christian mm -hmm. is, because they know, no, no coronavirus, no. You can't come in my body. You have no That's legal right, right to me. See, on the same day, on the same cross, at the same time, my Bible tells me Jesus bore it all. Hallelujah. And it even says in Deuteronomy 28, in any diseases and sicknesses that are not mentioned, they are a curse. And if he was made the curse, mm. <laughs> absorbed the mm. curse, and already paid the penalty for the curse, then that means as he is, so, so am, am I. I, and he did it for me. That means that when he's given me authority, that's yes, what the Bible says out of the right. sin, that I give you authority, right, to tread upon serpents and, and scorpions, scorpions and all the works of the devil, enemy. sickness and disease, the curse, all of it is the work of the devil. I love it in 1 John 3, 8. It says, for this reason was the Son of God manifested, that he may destroy mm. the works the of, the of the devil. Well, what are works of the devil? And not only did he destroy the works of the devil, it says in Ephesians, Colossians, for he spoiled principalities uh -huh. and powers making an open show of them, triumphing yes. over them. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I love it because now the word says Jesus is the head of all oh, principality, might, and dominion. Hallelujah. Oh, <laughs> Lord, that's good news. So when you're beginning to know and lay hold of and taking an yes. authority and walking in that authority and resisting, even though your body's crying out or your body's saying these symptoms, these symptoms, these symptoms, and you're saying no. I am redeemed from every curse. That's right. And you know, another beautiful scripture says in Colossians that God has delivered us from the authority and the power of darkness mm. and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Yes. And if you and I can say, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin, 
was made sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Just Hallelujah. as easily as I can declare and lay hold of, I am the righteousness of God in That's Christ right. Jesus. I don't feel righteousness. I never even looked at righteousness. <laughs> but righteousness came inside of me when I became a born again, brand new creation, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5. I became a brand new creation born of God and all old things have passed away. That old dead eternal spirit is no longer in me. The domination of sin nature is no longer in me. And that means the curse and everything that came with the curse <laughs> had to get out as well. That's right. Because in God, there is no darkness. He is light. And if God lives in you, the light of God is in you. You are the light, Jesus said. You are the light and you are the salt in the earth. Is that not true? Yes. But an unrenewed mind, because my soul didn't get saved, your soul didn't get born again, your body didn't get born again, but it was purchased with the blood yes. of Jesus. You know, the Bible says in Corinthians that my body is the temple of the Holy yes. Spirit of God. Your body is the Holy Spirit, temple of the Holy Spirit of God. My body was purchased by the blood of Jesus. And my body, listen to this, everybody, my body doesn't even belong to me. Mm. Woo. Don't think <laughs> on that a minute. It's true. Because the truth of the matter is, when I gave and confessed Jesus as my Lord, I became a new creation, and he became my Lord. See, the beautiful thing about God and his love is really in reality, if he wanted to, he has every right to say, you are all my slaves. And I bought you and I own you. Doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He has every right. See, because either you're a slave and owned by the devil or you are owned by God. Now the devil, he is horrible slave master. And he will kill you. His aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. But we don't have to fear because all power and authority, Jesus took it. Stripped them of the keys of death, hell, and the grave. That's what the word of God says. Mm -hmm. He no longer has authority over you. If you belong to Jesus, you have nothing to fear. But it is through Jesus. It is because of Jesus' finished work. It is because of the blood of Jesus. It is because of the faith and obedience of Jesus. And it is because of Jesus that God sees us holy, That's righteous, right. forgiven, loved, blessed. Because as Jesus Christ is, 1 John 4, 17, so are we in this life. Amen. And the revelation of that can only come by the Holy Spirit. Because my natural mind and human reasoning, your natural mind and human reasoning cannot understand that. Because Jesus said in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and they are life. They're not carnal, no. they're not fleshy, they're not for your body, for your nose to smell, <laughs> for your eyes to go, ooh, your ears to go, ooh, I got it, I got it. No, because Jesus said those who come to God must come in spirit, spirit and, in and in truth. Amen. But we worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. And that's why it bypasses through the carnal man. But when our soul man, our mind, will, and emotions are being renewed mm -hmm. to conform, to be transformed, by the word of God, this is our mirror. This is our spirit food. This is what tells us who we are. I can't know my identity by what I feel like or the things I touch with my hands mm -hmm. or what I smell in the air or my own way of thinking, carnal way of thinking, the way of this world. That's why Romans 12 says, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, Presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, mm. holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And verse 2 says, and don't be conformed to this world the way the world thinks, the negativity, mm. the doubt, the unbelief, the carnality. 
because it cannot please God. It cannot know God, right? It says, but be transformed. What? Your soul, man. Your mind being transformed like a caterpillar in that cocoon, you know, when it's all ugly looking and squirmy like a worm. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how all that works, but that cocoon mm -hmm. starts weaving itself around that caterpillar. Hallelujah. And then there's the act of metamorphosis. It's the act of transformation. Well, your spirit it's is not process, being transformed because yes. your spirit is already born of God. Mm -hmm. It's the soul man. It's the sanctification and the transformation of that mind being renewed with the word of God so that the soul and the spirit are able to come in agreement because this body it can't go anywhere this body says the body is dead because of sin the body cannot be revived the body cannot be made alive to to worship God the body is neutral you know it says in Corinthians I love it says <laughs> for the Lord is for the body and the body is for the Lord. Lord yeah. He cares about yes. our bodies. He wants our body well. He wants you to feel good. He wants yes. you to feel strong. He wants you to feel health and wholeness. Do you know that? Do you know it's the will of God that we not live in pain mm -hmm. in our bodies? It's the will of God that we have energy and we are thriving. It's the will of God that we eat what is right for our bodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we wanted to really go there, you know that our bodies are the temple of God, that he owns my body? Yes. When I gave, because you know it says, my life is hidden in Jesus with God. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Know ye not? And if you don't think that verse is talking about our physical body, when it's in Corinthians and Paul is dealing with them because of temple prostitutes and all of that that was going on, because you know they were Gentiles and they had come into Jesus and they were still wanting to practice the things they were doing. You know, and Paul's like, wait a minute. He didn't say, you old sinners, you old religious bad Christians. He didn't say that to them because he knew they didn't know. They didn't know they were spirit, soul, and body. So they were still doing the acts in their body and their soul because that's all they knew to do. Yeah, yeah. And he said, wait a minute. Do you not know that your body is the temple yeah, of the Holy yes, Spirit? Yes. And you don't take the members of your body or the temple of God and join it with a harlot. Now, come on now. Harlot's not spiritual. He's talking about with a lady in the temple who's a prostitute. So we, he's talking about the physical body. So and then he says, don't you know that the body is the Lord's and the Lord is for the body? God's for your mm. body. And you are members of Christ. How be it take the members of Christ wow. and join it with a harlot? So God covers the body. He covers the spirit. He covered the soul. The soul he covers, he says, don't you know you have the mind of Christ? See, he covered it all. I believe it's in 1st or 2nd Thessalonians 5 where he says, I wish above all your spirit, mm. your soul, and your body be preserved blameless. So God is for our body. Amen? Amen. I mean, after all, he did create us. <laughs> and everything he made was good. He was well pleased with his creation. He's the one that put this body together. Psalms 139, it says, Lord, thank you. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes. You may look at your body this morning. Yes, you ladies out there on live stream as well as in this auditorium. You may have looked at your body this morning and criticized yourself because something was drooping, dragging, sagging, or something <laughs> just out, or something would not fit good in the pants. <laughs> are the girls, they just hanging down more than what they used to. And girls know what I mean when I say the girls. Does everybody know what I mean when I'm saying <laughs> yes. the girls are here? Okay. Yes. Because they just ain't what they used to be. Uh, but it's okay. But they have a lot of <laughs> undergarment stuff now, right, to help make them perky, if you want it that way. Uh, but God didn't look at your body this no. morning and say, ugh, how disgusting, or hanging, singing, dragging, wagging. He doesn't look at you like that. And you know what? He doesn't want you talking about yourself that mm -mm. way. Because you are he beautiful. Doesn't see you, that way. Yes. you know, I was going through a bad time, Mandy, amongst thousands of bad times <laughs> <laughs> we encounter throughout our life, right? Because yeah. we're in a fallen world and trials and tribulations, and we get attacked in our mind, and we go through gloomy days, and yes. where we're just not riding high in essence and not taking authority over our thoughts. And for those of you who don't know, I've been divorced two times. 
and married for the third time and last time with me and my husband, Robert, and I said, to death do we part. So if any point he says, uh, one time I was saying, so if any point he wanted to part, he must be ready to go to heaven. <laughs> and my daughter goes, Mama, you shouldn't say that because if anything ever happened, people are going to think you did something to him. <laughs> I go, oh, no, but this no. is for real. We're in it. We're in it till we end it by going to heaven, mm -hmm. no matter what comes, because of knowing better, knowing differently now. And I was, had gone through that second divorce, born again, spirit-filled man, you know, came even to this church together. And it was devastating because he made a decision he didn't want to be married to me anymore. And I just thought, well, no. <laughs> God wants us to stay married. We're Christians. This can work. And so even after we separated, I stood for a year telling God's word, this is what your word says. This is what your word says. My marriage is healed. My marriage is... I mean, I'm just forcing it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make the word work. <laughs> but inside of me, I wasn't believing it mm -hmm. because the rejection mm -hmm. and his voice of rejection was greater. And I was devastated and broken and depressed. Mm. And I felt like such a failure. I felt like I failed God. I was so embarrassed. I'm going through a second divorce and I was only 20 something years old. Mm -hmm. I got married the first time I was 18. Had my daughter when I was 19. Out of that marriage when I was 20. Had been with him since I was 15 years old. Out of rebellion. And then I got born again at 20 years old came to this wonderful church, met this man. Yay, marry a Christian. I didn't have a clue. I was such a baby in the Lord. All I knew was Jesus loves me, he's in me, he's for me, and this man needs to be the Christian, and oh my gosh, and believing God can do anything. But I had so many broken things in my soul. Mm. I had so many scars and hurts and pains inside my own soul. I really should not have gotten remarried. Because I was so broken and still didn't know, mm -hmm. right? But like me and all the dramatics, mm -hmm. <laughs> but God's merciful. Even in my ignorance, even in my disobedience, the grace of God is greater. Yes, the mercy I mean. of God is greater. Because the one thing I knew is Jesus loves me. He's for me. Yes. I mean, he saved my life. No one's taking him. <clears throat> I don't understand all of what's going on and what's happening. But Jesus, I'm holding on to you. Yes. Right? So one day I came up to the altar, it was on a Wednesday night, but I was feeling like such a failure. I mean, I was like, God, I am just dumb. I am just, I was saying all kinds of horrible things, tearing myself down with my thoughts. Of course, I wasn't telling anybody, <laughs> but in my head, I was like, Margie, you are so stupid. You just cannot get it right. You are such a failure. Now, you can't even make a marriage work. I mean, you're nothing. I mean, all of these negative thoughts were going through my mind. And I came to a Wednesday night service, and they were up praying for people. And so I went up for prayer, and I had been standing for about over a little, over a year. And I was getting to a place where I was asking God, you know, what, what do I do from here? What do I do, Lord? He keeps telling me he doesn't want me. He keeps telling me he doesn't want to be married to me. He doesn't see anything worth being married to me. I mean, and that was just rejection, slapping me unbelievably. Mm. And so I came up to be prayed for, and the lady prayed for me. She says, Margie, what do you want? I said, what? <laughs> she said, Margie, what do you want? I said, I want to be happy. I want to live and thrive in the Lord. And then she said something to me. She said, that's what God wants for mm. you. I was shocked. I was like, God's not that's mad so at me. so true, yes. God doesn't feel I deserve to be punished? <clears throat> I mean, really? After everything that's gone on, God wants me to be happy? He wants me to keep receiving his love? Because condemnation and guilt and shame were telling me, you're nothing. You're not worthy, but I didn't know about the mercy and the goodness of God and the forgiveness of God. I didn't know that God saw everything, knew everything, the why behind my do. He knew it more and better than I did. And he knew I needed him. I needed his love. I needed it for his forgiveness. And God's not rebuking you. God's not condemning you. God's not judging you. God's not shaming you. 
because of decisions and choices that have been made that have put you in a dark place of divorce or from drugs or whatever it may be. The good news is Jesus knew we were going to need his mercy and his blood and his forgiveness. And that's why in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, it says, come boldly to the throne of grace in your time of weakness yes. so that you may obtain mercy and favor to help you. Amen. Man and religion are the ones who have preached the hellfire and judgment of God Amen. and didn't tell of the mercy and the goodness of God that grace is greater than sin. Yes. In Romans 5 it says, don't even compare Adam's act to what Jesus did. For Adam's act brought condemnation and guilt on the whole world. But Jesus, his righteous Amen. act, of being obedient yes. to the cross for many transgressions. It says that it brought righteousness and life and grace, which was much more greater than what Adam did to bring sin on the human race. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Listen if you're watching live stream. What Jesus did for you on the cross was greater than Adam's sin brought on the whole world. So that that twisted way of thinking in an unrenewed mind that would make you think that your sin yes. and what you're going through is a punishment from God. It is a lie. Because God took all of our sin, Hallelujah. all of our punishment, yes, and he poured he it on his son. Glory Thank be you, to God. Jesus. And that is the gospel truth. But an unrenewed mind and a dark negative world will try to convince you otherwise because it's so negative and it's darkness and it's not the light of the gospel of God. And that's why we need to get in the word of yes. God and find out who we are we and are what God's Christ. word says, not what the world says, not what CNN says, not what any other news says, not what your own unrenewed mind is telling you. Because you have the mind of Christ and you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and you are who God says you are. Amen. My question is, who are you listening to today? Who has your attention more than the word of God does. I remember Pastor Ron was pre uh, teaching here recently on a Wednesday night, and he asked a question. He says, do you really believe what you're confessing? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I wrote it on a card. <laughs> he said, ask yourself this question. Do you mm. really do believe, believe what, what you're confessing? confessing? Mm. Do you really believe it? And if you're not believing it yet, Say, Lord God, thank you. You help my unbelief, and I'm going to yes. continue to renew my mind in Holy Spirit. So when I came up to the lady to be prayed for, and she said to me, Margie, God wants you to be happy. I cannot tell you. It was like as if a weight, mm. that weight of oppression, that weight of depression, that weight of condemnation and guilt. Yes, when I right. received that word, God wants me happy in him. God wants me to have life even after I've had a divorce for the second time. God still loves me. Mm -hmm. He's still for me. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It set me free. And then I begin to hear the Lord say, do you believe you are one with me, Margie? I said, yes, Lord. He said, do you believe I live in you and you live in me? I said, yes, Lord. He said, well, I will mm. never tear myself down. Mm. And he said yeah. this. This is what he said to me. If you believe I live in you and you live in me and everything you're saying about yourself, you're saying that about me, and that's not who I am. Wow. I am not a failure. I am not stupid. I am not wicked. I am none of those things. So what you're saying about yourself, yourself yeah, you're saying so that important. about me. And he said this to me, me and the Holy Ghost are not saying, I'm a bad God. <laughs> Look at what you did, God. I, he literally began to show me. And from that day on, I never, ever again, I mean, every now and then a thought may try to come, but I have never, ever again spoken things to myself about right. myself that were opposing what God says mm, who I am. Amen. I have never called myself stupid again. I may have thought it for a quick second, but those words have never come out of my mouth again. Because I saw from that night that God says, 
I am in you, and you are in me, and you are everything I say that you are. And it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, because if I'm saying things that are opposing the truth of who I am in the Lord, then I am turning, I'm discrediting, I'm not receiving the truth of who I am. And that's why we have to know what does God's word say about you? Who does God say that you are? Even when you looked in the mirror this morning, they like your <laughs> hair and those body parts and all that. Because the truth of the matter is, it is in you. He lives and moves and has his being. He is your God and you are his child. Mm. And he calls you righteous. He calls you holy. He calls you redeemed. Yes. He calls you his beloved. Hallelujah. He calls you the apple of his eye. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and that is the truth. And because that is the Jesus. truth. Amen. Yes. So maybe wow. you can open up in prayer. <laughs> But I got to add to that a little bit because it's so true. You know, you have to believe what God says about you. And real quick, I have shared this many of times, but every night, without a doubt, I always write things in this notebook. Mm -hmm. And about probably maybe a couple of years, I was going through something with one of my girls, you know, when you go through as a mom, you know, it wasn't nothing bad, but I was just feeling that I wasn't a good mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started writing here in my notebook, and I started sobbing, crying. And I started saying, I have been a good mother. And I have to write that over and over and over and over again. So you've, and, you've been a good mother even though you have made mistakes. Yes. Even though you have said things <laughs> yes. to them that weren't the best. Yes. Even though you said things that you had to repent from. Yes, and this is the thing that the enemy, one time I saw Joyce Meyer uh, with a devil here, and Jesus here. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus was saying good things to, to her. And then the devil over here was going, oh, what did you think? You think you are pretty? No, you mm -hmm. are not. Look at what you did in the past. You mm -hmm. just, you know, no worth it. And then God was sitting over here going like, I love you, Miss Margie. You know, you're doing what I tell you to do. And this is the thing that we believe in. Why is that? That we believe that negativity more than what God is saying. And you know what it is? God showed me a couple of days ago. He says, this is my letter. Yeah. This is a letter that he have written about him and for us to believe it. And then he told me one time, too, because you know how we listen to a lot of preachers and pastors and stuff like that. And when the pastor is talking and giving you verses and stuff like that, it's for you, for us, right. to write those verses. And then you go home and meditate. And when you spend time in this word, God reveals himself through his word. And uh, real quick, I just wanted to change because he said, I wanted to share this. It's a new song that for how long this song has been out, The Blessing? Uh, they wrote it this year, I think. Didn't they? It's a new song. And somebody. It, Carrie Job and her husband. And I want to share that with you ladies because it is powerful. It and I've been listening since I heard this song about probably maybe a month ago. You have shared this before we start. And I've been listening to this song and listening to this song. And everything that Margie, you know, Pastor Margie here is talking is we have to open our mouth. At home, in your car, even if you're taking a shower, mm -hmm. is opening your mouth and calling those blessings in. What God is saying about each or one of us. And this and this is going to be my prayer this morning to everybody that is watching, everybody that is here. Because God says in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, uh, is that right? Yeah, 624. I wrote it down. Anyways, and it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. And then in this song, I want for you guys to listen to this song because it's powerful. I'm just going to share a few things over here. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children, children, in the name of Jesus. And we receive that, that the blessings of God is upon our family, 
about our children and upon our children, children for thousands of generations. It's a verse that I put on my children's door when my girls were in junior high. Amen. When God was just stirring things on me that I didn't know that I would be standing over here today, and I'm still dealing with fear. You know, but God, yeah, but God is delivering me because I'm going to be bold to speak the word of God because it's inside of us. It's inside of us. And God wants for you to know that you are beautiful, that you are equipped, that you are confident, and your family and your children, your finances are blessed because God says so. In the name of Jesus. Amen Amen and amen. 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 We are blessed. Yes. And see, in the natural, things may not look blessed to you. You may be barely, you may be at a place where you're barely even to, able to pay your mortgage today, or your rent, or to even buy groceries. So looking with your physical eyes, you don't see what it looks like to be blessed. But the truth is, until I start coming in agreement, God, your word says, I am blessed. Not based on because I see it with my eyes, but I'm going to believe what your word says. And I am telling you, he's already commanded the blessing. Deuteronomy 28. If you've never read Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the curses and it talks about the blessing. And remember Galatians 3, 13, that Jesus was made a curse for all of us. For cursed, it is written, cursed is anyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham may come on the Gentiles. That's us. The blessings have come. They're here. We receive them. Now we need to see them. And what Mandy was saying is we come in agreement with what God's word says. And we speak what his word says. And if you read Deuteronomy 28, the blessings, it says, I am blessed coming in and going out. I am above and not beneath. I am the head and not the tail. My storehouses are blessed. You have to go read it. My cattle, my animals. We don't have all those like cows and sheep. We may not be farmers, but you may have animals. You have situations. You have storehouses. Your refrigerator, your cabinets, they're storehouses. Your bank account. You may say, well, I don't have a bank account yet. Start speaking it forth. But you have cabinets. You have a refrigerator. People have all kinds of storages. Go in your house where your toilet paper needs to be. If you're out of toilet paper, I'm blessed. I have more than enough to even give to other people. Right? Because that is what God has commanded the blessing. It's, remember when we were in Andrew Womack's spirit, soul, and body, and in Philemon, 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 it talks about having to acknowledge every good thing. And that's a key. Many people don't acknowledge every good thing that is already in our new created spirit. It's there, but if I'm not even acknowledging it, I'm not even being made aware that it's there so that I can begin to come in agreement and speak what God's word says. Lord, you said I am the righteousness of God. And I don't care if I don't feel righteous today. Nothing can take my righteousness because it's who I am. Jesus made me righteous. When I got born again, born of God and became as he is in my own spirit, I received the righteousness of God. See, that's what the word says. You're a joint heir with Jesus. You're an heir of Almighty God. Everything that is his is yours. Oh, my goodness. It's so good. And I just double dog dare you <laughs> to go home and start writing out the words of God. Go to the book of Ephesians. Oh, my goodness. Ephesians will put you real quick into your identity of who you are in Jesus and what he's done for you. Because the word of God is alive and living. You know, I love something Lucy Rael said last Tuesday. She said, you are amazing women. You are amazing men. We are amazing because we are in him. Get in front of the mirror and declare that. I am an amazing child of God. I mean, most days I wake up, and when I wake up, I say, Lord, thank you. This is a day that you have made, and I choose to rejoice in this day. 
And by the time I make it to my mirror, I look in that mirror straight in my eyes and I say, Lord, I thank you that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I thank you that surely Jesus has borne all of my sicknesses and diseases. And I begin to speak out Isaiah 53. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I'm not trying to get healed. I am the healed. And sickness and disease has got to go because it doesn't belong to me. I don't accept you. I don't receive you. And I take authority over you. And I'm going to bless the Lord my God because he already healed me. I'm just as much healed as I am saved. And I don't doubt my salvation. And I ain't doubting my healing. And not only that, your word says that you have raised me up together with you and seated me together with you in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. I am in a position of ruling and reigning in Jesus, not through Margie. Margie's words mean nothing. It's in Jesus. I pray a revelation of Jesus comes to you today, that you see him as you are in him and one with him. That is my prayer for us today. Amen? Well, we're in a better way to pray. And you either can say, oh, yay, or oh, me, or oh, my. Because this book, if you've been reading it, I'm sure may have been knocking over some other, some other learned behaviors <laughs> about prayer and some questionings like, oh, my gosh. I mean, did he just say that? But reminding you, Everything he's talking about in this book is what he's done himself before, right? So if someone is telling you there's a better way, not the only way, but a better way to pray, to get better results than what you've been getting, if you've been stuck and you've not been seeing the word manifest in your life, right? Then it's like, Lord, there's something I'm missing. And there is, it's a, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, the more you begin to do that, the less painful it becomes <laughs> and the less struggle you'll have with pride because pride is always trying to rule in my life somewhere. I, I know it. I got it. Or I think I got it. Or I think I know what's... No, I... No. <laughs> and instead of, Lord, you know everything. God, you're everywhere. You are God and I am not. You see everything. You hear everything, and you know everything because you are the creator of everything. <laughs> Remember Psalms 100, 100, verse 2, for it is you, he who has made us, and not we ourselves. Bottom line, you know, it's, uh, to bring it down to, if Mercedes-Benz car was taken to the Toyota or taken to, uh, let's see, Mr. Bishi or whatever, and Mr. Bishi would say, I'm not your creator. I don't have your parts. I don't know how to fix you because I'm Mr. Bishi and you're Mercedes. So we don't go to animals to say to the animals, make me feel good. Make me be who I need to be. Make me feel my worth and value. So I'm not going to go to the makeup counter. Makeup, make me, I mean, it can make me, make me look a little prettier. <laughs> but the makeup's not going to make me feel how I need to feel. It will maybe for a hot second or a day or two, but eventually the makeup's not going to be enough. The cup of coffee, the latte at Starbucks or whatever, it may bring a little bit of satisfaction, but it won't last because it's not your creator. God is our creator, and it's only in him that we find the true value and satisfaction of the life of joy, right, and validation is in Jesus. Because he is the master builder. He is our creator. He is the one who made us in his image. So he knows how we function, right? It is not man who created the body. It's God in his image. Man did not. Adam was not alive when God created him. Did you get that? Did that make sense? Adam was not alive when God created him. And God made all of the animals. He made all of the herbs. God made the Garden of Eden before he ever even made Adam. He made the sun. He made the moon. Go read it in Genesis. He made all provision before he ever made the man so that when the man was made, everything he needed was already available. That's good news. What a loving daddy. What a loving God. What a great creator. Not no apes 
Apes didn't do that. And then it wouldn't have been fair to the apes because they stopped, they stopped evolving a long time ago. And I've never heard anywhere in the history of a human being giving birth to an ape, have you? I mean, someone may lie and try to make it up. So we know that whole theory is not even the truth. Right? And if there was a big bang, then I think maybe someone had a vision of when God made the sun or the moon and they just saw a big spark or something. But the truth is, God is our creator, not man, not aliens, not a big boom, and not the apes. The truth is, Genesis says, in the beginning, I refuse to settle, I refuse to cowtail, I refuse to retreat in this day and age from speaking the truth of what God's word says. It does not help people, it does not serve them, and I will not be a coward. Even if it meant I would be persecuted or rejected, I do not care. Because there are people who need to hear the truth and want to hear the truth so they can be set free. Amen? I am not going to be in agreement with this world's lies. I will not side in with darkness. And I most definitely will have nothing to do with the devil's tactics. Not that I'm aware of. I may have ignorantly because I'm still growing, but I refuse to. And I thank God that he is saying to his body, his church, be strong, be courageous, and preach the truth. In love. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, we're in chapter 2 today. If you have your books, we do have a few books left for those who haven't received one yet. And you can see me after Bible study today, and I'll get it for you so that you can have it. This book does not come with a study guide. Uh, those watching live stream, you can go to Andrew Walmack's ministry. Andrew Walmack's ministry is such a blessing that even if you can't afford the book, they will send it to you for free. That's what he has committed to, and that's what he stays committed to because he has partners, and maybe that's something God may even be speaking to your heart, but they give the material for free as well. So we're on page 11, if you want to turn there. And it says, the title of chapter 2 is, How Long Do You Pray? And many of you who were Christians back in the 80s and the 90s, you can relate to there was teachings going around of how long you need to spend in prayer for that to be effective, for you to be a good Christian. You know, if you weren't spending a certain amount of time in prayer, then something was wrong with you, and there was the condemnation and the religion and just the pressure. And so, of course, like good Christians wanting to be obedient, wanting to get to know God, and just taking it and running with it because of what people were saying instead of just really, like, God, what are you saying? You know, because, of course, everybody wants to go with the tide, right? You know, everybody's going down upstream and what have you. And many times, you know, as Christians, like Mandy was saying, when a pastor or someone is ministering and they're giving you a Bible verses, write them down. Go home and look them up. Read them for yourself. Begin to meditate. When she said meditate, meditate, you're just thinking on that. You're running that verse over in your mind. You're speaking that verse over and over out of your mouth. That's what meditate means. You know, you're thinking on that. So anything you hear me saying, Mandy saying, anything you hear coming from this platform and we're giving you the word of God, then it's on you to take the scriptures and to go home and get in that word and get before God and let him unveil it to you. And if you have any questions, ask us. For those of you watching live stream, you don't know, but we stay together a whole nother 30 minutes. Once we go off live stream, we stay together to 12 o'clock so that we can do that very thing, so that we can pray for people. Our Bible study normally starts at 9.30. We just start live streaming at 10. And as of today, we're now able to come back in and to have Bible study. So we will continue to do that. But those who maybe didn't know it on live stream, that is something we do once we go off live stream. We still continue to do our Bible study until 12 o'clock. So are you with me? Here we go. Page 11, chapter 2, How Long Do You Pray? Even though much of today's so-called prayer offends God, he's big enough to handle it. Now, I don't know if God told Andrew Womack he was offended or not, <laughs> but this is what he's saying. Our Heavenly Father is great enough to put up with some immaturity in his beloved children. 
Everything I'm teaching against, I once did. That is what Andrew Womack is saying. Everything he's teaching against, he once did it. God tolerated and even blessed me while I still prayed these ways. He wasn't mad at me, but many of my so-called prayers went unanswered. When I confront one of the ways you pray, please don't think I'm saying that God is mad at you. He's not. God's a good God. But if you are like I was, you are snared by the words of your mouth. I discovered that there are right and wrong ways to pray. Through his word, the Lord radically changed my view and practice a prayer over the years. I'm so glad he did this because my mindset needed to be changed. How about you? I know me, there's still areas in my mindset that need to be changed. Keep an open heart. As you read this book, keep an open heart and an ear tuned in to the Holy Spirit. He is your teacher. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be our teacher, didn't he? If you read in the book of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he, the Spirit of truth, when he comes, he will lead and guide you into all truth. He will take what is of mine and reveal it to you. He is our teacher. He is our helper. He is our comforter. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's what the Word of God says. He's your teacher and guide who leads you into all truth. Don't let an occasional offense Stop you from reading this through all the way to the end. Say, self, I will read this book all the way to the end. Although I may be tempted to disagree and to close the book, I will read it all the way to the end. All righty. By continuing to hold on to unproductive prayer patterns, you have much more to lose than gain. In fact, your humility and willingness to consider before the Lord what I am sharing with you could mean the difference between life and death for you or someone you love. Trust me, it's not worth the risk. I don't claim to have arrived concerning prayer but I have definitely left. I regularly see miracles of every kind happen in my life and ministry. My own son was raised up from the dead, being dead for five hours. I've seen many blind eyes and deaf ears opened, not to mention all of the cancer healed, people coming out of wheelchairs, and demons cast out. And I think that we can humbly say, if we were to say, well, you know what? I've seen all this happen too. Well, then maybe you don't need to hear any more of this book. But if we cannot humbly say, you know what? That's right. I've never seen anyone healed of cancer. Or I'll come out of a wheelchair through my prayers, through your prayers. But yet Jesus said to all his disciples, the word he gave in Matthew 10, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, and cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. To all his disciples. Think about that a minute. I don't claim to arrive, he said. Okay, and we're down towards the middle. Also, our ministry experiences a constant flow of abundant provision to do what God has called us to do. I don't mention these things to condemn you or to exalt me because of all the glory belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. However, I do want to challenge you to consider these results compared to what you are getting. If you are not seeing these kinds of things on a regular basis, not sporadically, not here a little, there a little, because that's a lie too. You know, to think that God only wants to do a little miracle here and there every now and then. No, it's the way of life. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus' whole ministry marked demons being cast out and people being healed from sickness and disease. It wasn't every now and then. It was ongoing. And then reading the book of Acts. 
and see what happened to the apostles and then begin to read in the epistle. Read about Paul and the ministry that went forth through him. All righty. <laughs> Honestly evaluate your prayer life as I confront different attitudes and popular understandings. This is your chance to recognize and root out unwanted hindrances that have been choking your effectiveness in prayer. Wow. Remember, growing pains just mean you're being stretched as you're maturing, as you mature. But thou, he's quoting Matthew 6, 6. But thou, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. That's Matthew chapter 6, 6. People have actually challenged me, contending, you should never pray in public. Well, we were never taught that in this church. You know, we've had, I mean, our pastors have always taught us, and Pastor Mike and Ron, Pastors Mike and Rhonda still believe and do the same thing. We, so we have never been taught that you can't pray in public. But there are churches and people that have been taught that. And maybe someone watching or someone sitting in here, you were taught that as well. The parallel of this passage begins in Luke 11, 1. When Christ's public praying calls the disciples to ask, will you teach us to pray? When Jesus was praying publicly, it caused them to ask Jesus, will you teach us to pray? If the Lord literally meant to always pray in secret so that nobody ever heard you, then he broke his own instruction. Here in Matthew 6, 5 through 6, Jesus basically declared, don't be like the hypocrites who pray for the attention and recognition of people, their motive, their reason for doing it. Having been to many churches, Andrew speaking, I've heard all kinds of public prayer. People often speak loudly in the form of King James English, thinking it's more spiritual. I'm not against the King James Version of the Bible. It's actually my favorite. But I don't feel like I have to talk that way to God in order to truly pray. I've met individuals who never talk King James style, except when they pray. <laughs> they become all religious sounding and speak in a different tone of voice. Thou must do us this and that for me. That's hypocritical. It may shock you, but God doesn't enjoy many of our prayers. I found this out the hard way. When I first became really excited about the Lord, people told me I needed to pray an hour a day. I thought, if an hour a day is good, then two or three would be even better. So I disciplined myself to pray for one to three hours a day, daily. For months, perhaps even years, listen to what he's saying. For months, even years, I begin this regimented prayer time at seven o'clock sharp, trying to spend a certain segment of time each day praying greatly frustrated me. In fact, it never really seemed to produce any good results. Many believers have started and stopped this not only once, but multiple times. For me, it just never seemed to flow. Many people who truly love God with all their heart find it difficult to pray in such a prescribed manner. Their once vibrant relationship with the Lord becomes stifled, mechanical, and lifeless instead. Just think about that. They went from this thriving, enjoying the Lord and just being with him to this regiment of God, okay, I'm going to do an hour. And then they became stifled, mechanical, is what began to happen to them. If you're attempting to pray this way, perhaps the reason why it's not flowing is because the Holy Spirit is trying to talk you out of it. This practice did help me learn to discipline myself. I wasn't spending my time watching television or doing something else harmful to my faith, but overall, this prayer time was a real drag. Why am I doing this? I remember first starting out. I closed my eyes and prayed for what seemed to be an extended period of time. After a while, I wondered, how long have I prayed? Looking up at my clock, I saw that five minutes had passed. Five minutes? I thought it had been at least 30 minutes. Have any of you ever been there when you started trying to develop a prayer life? I can remember being down on my knees and praying and praying and thinking, man, surely I've gone an hour. And I look at the clock and I go, what? It's not even 10 minutes, right? So I can relate to what he's saying. 
Well, I can remember that when I was starting out as a Christian and hearing about this way of teaching. I thought it had been at least 30 minutes, perhaps even an hour. Disappointment set in as I continued praying. God, this hour is never going to pass. I'd be enjoying the Lord's presence and great things would be happening each day while studying the word and worshiping. Then it would be time for me to go pray. Finally, around 6.45 a.m. one day, I confided, God, I don't mean this to be bad. Really, I love you. It's not a problem with you at all. But this prayer time stinks. I hate it. This time seems like the slowest hour of my whole day. I don't mean to be critical, but I'm just telling you the way it is. Beginning at 6.30, I start dreading it. Now listen to what he says. Promptly, the Lord spoke to my heart. I start dreading it at 6 o'clock personally. I can hardly stand that hour. Immediately, my lightning finds past my reason. If God isn't enjoying it and I'm not enjoying it, then why am I doing this? So I quit praying like that and my spiritual life greatly improved. See, religion, legalism, working is what he started doing. And it wasn't working. You know, the word of God says in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, that the word of God is a, desi is a discerner of the soul and the spirit, that it knows the intents and motives of our heart. His whole motive was trying to work at this, thinking that it was going to get God to do something more or please God even more or just be obedient instead of a relationship. It became legalism. It became religious. It became just works and then began to pull away from just the joy of the relationship and making things more mechanical and taking away the personal part of being in relationship with God. Jesus came so that we could have a personal relationship with Heavenly Father, with Holy Ghost, with the Lord Jesus. You know, in the book of John, the 17th chapter, Jesus is praying. And he tells this is eternal life. He gives the definition of what eternal life means in John 17. It says it means to know the Father and to know his Son who he sent. That means to get to know him personally, to know his thoughts, to know how he thinks, to know how he sees me, to know how he loves me, to know how he approves of me, to know how he accepts me. And God enjoys being with you. Just you, spending time with you. That's relationship. He did what he did because he wants us. He loves us. He's our father. He wants to help us. He wants relationship. Now, I know that because of the time we live in, and so much brokenness that many people didn't have mothers or fathers who loved us like God loves us. Many of us have come out of brokenness and rejection and didn't know what it's like to be truly nurtured, to be truly accepted, to have affirmation and encouragement, to have things spoken to you that lift you up. And even when you're corrected, not to be made to feel condemned because God does correct us with his word. But he never makes me feel condemned. He never makes me feel rejected or unwanted. He never puts me in a corner and turns his back on me. And many people watching and in this room, you've experienced that through relationships. Maybe you can't even say, I can honestly say, I have actually have a very, I have experienced a very fulfilling relationship where I've really felt validated and loved and accepted. And because of that, many times people will reject the Lord or reject something like this being said. And therefore, try to work at it, try to earn it, try to deserve it. And that's not the love of God. God is love. God is love. Love is God. <laughs> and God's love has been poured out in the Christian's heart by the Holy Spirit. So the God kind of love lives in you, wherewith we're able to even love him back. Hmm, just think about that. Not a superficial love. It's amazing. Amen? 
Okay. Let me find my spot. I think I'm down and I'm going to read uh, immediately. Okay, 6, 7. Right here, Matthew 6, 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. From God's perspective, praying an hour a day has no value in and of itself. Now that may have just rocked somebody's world. Most people basically believe the longer I pray, the better it is and the more God will answer. Just think about that. The longer I pray, the better it is and the more God will answer. Therefore, praying longer is the solution to everything. Brothers and sisters, there is absolutely no virtue in long praying. Jesus normally kept his prayers short. Only twice in the whole New Testament did he pray all night. Since both are recorded in all four Gospels, you might think it was eight. Really? It was just two different occasions. The Lord didn't usually pray for extended amounts of time. The shorter the prayer, the greater the faith. The shorter the prayer, the greater of faith. But it's been the opposite, isn't it? Pray long enough, hard enough to get that faith aroused so that you can have faith to be released. That's what the mind would try to say. That's what people would try to say. They're up. You got to go pray long to get that faith to working. The shorter the prayer, the greater the faith. Peace, be still. Calm the raging storm in Mark 4, 39. That was prayer. Lazarus, come forth. Raise the dead with just three words in John eleven forty three. As you understand prayer more correctly, yours will shorten too. In fact, a friend of mine teaches that help is a great prayer. I fully agree with his friend. There have been times when that's all I've said. God, help. Jesus, have mercy right now. And I have seen the Lord move in that moment. But that's as we're growing and knowing who he is, who it is that's living in you, how much he loves you, and how you can believe he's there and his word is true and he is for you. He is for you. God is for you. He is for you, not against you. He wants it more than you want it. God wants you well more than you want to be well. God wants you healed more than you want to be healed. Start meditating on that. You know, after I went through those two divorces and went through condemnation and guilt and felt so unworthy, and the devil would even tell me I didn't deserve to ever be married again, I blew it. After seven years, when I finally started desiring to be married again, you know, he would tell me I have to stand in the, in the divorce people line to get the leftover kind of people. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't worthy of the best meat. <laughs> think about it. Condemnation and guilt will make you think that way. Oh, no, Margie, you go stand, you go find the divorce people line. Because you can't be in the line of the people who never had divorce. Because you don't deserve a spouse. You don't deserve a husband who's never been married. No, girl, you got to settle for the scraps now. Because you're used good. You messed up. So you're not going to get the best. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God doesn't change his mind. If that was the case, every single one of us who have sinned, you better get in the sin, the, the sin waistline. Every single one of us will have to be there. Because even if you didn't have a divorce before, you've sinned somewhere, right? He may be telling you, you have to stay poor. You have to do without because you blew and you messed up your money. Or you can never have children because you know what? I, whatever lie it is, I'm here to tell you, that is not what the word of God says. Jesus is a redeemer. He ransomed us with his blood and his blood paid it all. His blood paid it all. His blood genuinely made you a brand new creation. Jesus already has forgiven you of your past, present, and future sins. God said, I will not deal with you according to your sins. 
That's what the word of God says. That means he's not punishing you. He's not making you pay and go to the back of the line because of your disobedience of something you did and therefore you cannot have the best. It is a lie. God is nothing but the best. He has nothing but the best. He doesn't tell us we have to settle for the way this world is. The world does that. The world treats people like that, don't they? Man. We've got to get that stinking thinking out. Because God is not saying that to you. There are women in this room watching live stream that you want to be married again, and you may be older now, and you've been struggling, thinking God is withholding from you, or you're not worthy, or you're not deserving. We can never be worthy and deserving of anything. It's because of Jesus. He, his worthiness has made us worthy. And now we're children of God. You are wanted women, wanted men, and God wants to bless you. He wants to fill your life with joy and happiness. And if your desire is to have a, a spouse, a husband or a wife, if you're a woman, you want a husband. If you're a man, you want a wife, a female wife. That is the will of God. Don't let go of that. Don't let the enemy talk you out of that. Why shouldn't you have fulfillment in your latter years if that's what you want? Well, I guess I'm just going to live out the last of my older years without any man, without any woman. I'm just sitting by myself, go with my friends, we have coffee. But everything inside of you wants companion, wants to be hugged, wants the attention and affection of a man, wants to share your life. Want to be a part of giving your life to someone. The devil is a liar. He's a liar. God says, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them. Oh, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, I pray in the name of Jesus. That lie, it leaves you now. You hope again. Stir up your faith. Get back in faith. Put your feet, plant your feet. Begin to thank the Lord. God, I thank you for my husband, or I thank you for my wife. No, I'm not too old to enjoy pleasures of life again. And if your spouse is gone and has passed away in glory, they're not in heaven thinking about you. There's not going to be the giving of marriage in heaven. You say, but man, what if I, I marry two men and they're gone? When I get to heaven, which one's going to be mine? None of them. They're your brother in the Lord. We won't have a need. We don't have these bodies. We won't have these bodies in heaven. Jesus fills all in all. We're not even going to be thinking about, oh, I want to be kissed. Oh, I want to be hugged. Oh, I need affection. I need attention. No, not in heaven. Okay, just pause, see, lock, think on that a minute. But while you're here on earth, he wants you to be able to enjoy. Oh, my goodness. John 10, Jesus came that we may have life and have it in abundance. And if part of that life in abundance for you is being married again in your latter years, go for it! Somebody needed to hear that. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Don't listen to the lies of the devil and don't let other people talk you out of it. Don't let them. They're not in your shoes and it's okay for you to want to be married again. Your kids are grown and on their own. <laughs> right? Hallelujah. I hear somebody on the live stream just screaming, preach it, preach it, preach it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Isn't God good? He loves us so much. Wow. He wanted somebody to know that. You want to be married in your latter years. God wants that for you. That desire is from him. He wants to bring it to pass for you. Forget about what you're looking at in the mirror. God has someone. Just keep your eyes open when he brings them across your path. Don't discredit it. And don't lose it because your heart starts skipping a beat like a little high school girl and you feel all the woozies. That's good. Because your soul is not getting old. 
Your body may be aging, but your mind's not. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> okay, where am I? <laughs> we'll pay 17. 16. Don't fool yourself. Is that where I left off? No. Here we go. Okay. When I pray for long, longer periods of time, a significant portion is usually spent praying in tongues. I'm not so much petitioning God as I am promoting my own spiritual growth. I'm praying for and receiving wisdom and revelation from the Lord. Self-edification is important New Testament purpose of prayer. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. That's what it says in Jude. Right, it's talking about from the inside out, where there's weariness, where there's disappointment, where there's a feeling of giving up. You know, I believe it's in Galatians 6, 9, it says, don't become weary in doing well, for in due season you will reap if you don't faint. Praying in tongues keeps us from fainting, keeps us from giving up, keeps us from stopping and letting go of our confession and letting go of our faith and what we're trusting in the promises of God. When we begin to pray in the Spirit, it keeps building us up because the Holy Spirit of God is a prayer language, it's tongues, it's a heavenly language, it's a spiritual language that is influencing through my soul to my body. Hallelujah. That's what he's talking about, right? However... The majority of the body of Christ views prayer primarily as an opportunity to petition God. They see it very narrowly as their time to plead with him to meet their needs. Of course there are scriptures which reveal that asking and receiving is a valid use of prayer, but you ought to confine it to 5% or less of your prayer life. Based on my relationship with the Lord, I believe this is best. This is what Andrew Womack is saying. Don't fool yourself. What would be left of most Christians' prayer lives if all the repenting for sin, asking for things, and intercession were subtracted? Wow, think about that a minute. Hardly anything. Most people's prayers consist of, oh God, I'm so sorry because I failed you. Man, I can remember living that way as a young Christian. Being so sorry, repenting, repenting, God, please forgive me. Help me, Lord. What can I do, Lord? Help me feel better, Lord. Help me. May I remember praying that way a lot. Help me overcome this problem. God, heal this and provide that. And if they're really spiritual, do this and that for these other people. That's about what it amounts to. Adam and Eve prayed for none of those things. They had nobody to intercede for, no demons to cast out, no kingdoms to tear down. They had no clothes, food, houses, or even jobs to believe for. No petitions at all. But yet, they met with God every evening in the cool of the day and communed with him. Their conversations with God had nothing in them concerning sin, lack, need, problems, repenting, begging, or pleading. Yet, they prayed, communed with God, every single day. Prayer becomes religious when you try to use it for something God never intended. That's why it doesn't flow. You can promise him, I'm going to pray an hour a day if it kills me, and then do it for a week, a month, or two, but it never lasts because that's not the way he's leading you. Don't fool yourself into thinking you'll be heard by praying long periods of time or using certain words to petition him again and again and again. The Lord made it very clear that that isn't what prayer is. That was Matthew 6, 7 we read earlier. A fellow from another church came to Colorado Springs to preach many years ago. His whole message and ministry centered on exhorting people to pray an hour a day using the Lord's Prayer. I attended his meetings and received some benefit from what he shared. Then he came over to see me in my office. Right away he asked, how much do you pray each day? His question took me entirely off guard. I never really sat down and figured that up before. As I thought about it, I wondered, why does this guy want to know how long I pray each day? I could only think of two possible reasons. One, he wanted to compare himself to me and hope that he'd come out looking better, build up his ego and feel good about himself. Or two, he wanted to condemn me 
and uses apparent spiritual leverage to show how start to somehow start manipulating and controlling me to respond favorably to him. Those were the only two benefits I could see to his question. While pondering how to answer him, the Lord asked me, how much time did you spend with your wife yesterday? I told him, well, we spent the whole day together doing different things. If you were with Jamie all day long, how could you reduce your relationship down from that to spending just one hour with her and call it an improvement? <clears throat> he continued, I'm available to you all the time. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you reduced our relationship down to just one hour of prayer a day, that would be a sorry relationship compared to what we already enjoy. So in like manner, I boldly responded to this brother, do you know what? I spend all day with God in prayer. A look of shock came over his face as he stammered, no, no, no you just don't understand what I mean. No, you don't understand what I mean. I spend all day in communion with God. That's prayer. Prayer is communion with God. If he's with you all of the time, you ought to be praying all of the time. The expression of this communion isn't limited to a particular set of body positions. In the Bible, people knelt, raised their hands, and even looked up into heaven at times. But don't make a religious form out of these things and require their presence in order to consider something prayer. You can pray with your eyes open or closed, hands raised or down, standing, kneeling, or prostrate, which means to lay on your face. Since meditation is prayer, Psalms 5.1, you don't even have to talk out loud. Your communion with God should be constant. There are special times when you have an intimate relationship with someone. My wife and I don't have a schedule that allows us to have a date night every single week, but we go out and do things together regularly. The face-to-face -face time alone that we share helps build intimacy into our marriage relationship. Without setting aside these times, it would be easy to get so busy with life that we never have time for each other. Likewise, it's appropriate to isolate yourself along with God for special times of intimacy. But not all of the time. You must learn to relate to him in the midst of your daily responsibilities and weekly routines because they occupy the majority of your life. It's totally unrealistic for a spouse for spouses to limit their relationship only to their special times together. Jesus, your eternal husband, is the same. Don't limit your relationship with him only to dates. Walk and talk with him all day, every day. Some people try to make their relationship with God be this constant, constantly, constantly spectacular thing. They think they must be screaming at the top of their lungs, kneeling, hands held high, tears rolling down their cheeks, lightning bolts flashing and thunder crashing all around in order to really be in communion with God. If that's what you consider prayer, you, will ne you are never going to prosper. One of the things that made me certain that Jamie was the girl I was supposed to marry was the fact that we just enjoyed being with each other, unlike other girls. I didn't have to entertain or impress her. We could spend hours without saying a word and have a great time together. There is a place for this kind of attitude in prayer. God wants each of us to mature to the point where we can enjoy just hanging out with him. He desires our fellowship when there's nothing being said, nothing specific happening other than being together and loving each other. Personally, I like to build my relationship with God through studying scriptures. Reading the Bible is prayer to me because I do it with my heart, not just with my head. When I'm fellowshipping with God, one scripture can occupy me for hours as I meditate, ask, question, and let him speak revelation. Come, this is prayer. There's an old song, oh, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. How many of you remember that hymn? Right? And the joy we share as I linger there, none other can ever compare. Oh, he walks with me and he talks with me 
and he tells me I am his own. See, that's what he's talking about. God is walking with you and talking with you. And the joy that comes as I linger there with him. And something, you know, in this, and, and just closing with this, it's about relationship. Relationship. And it will take time to start that process. It'll take time to get your mind to settle down and to just say, Lord, you know what, today I'm just going to spend thanking you. And your mind's going to go, but what about, and what about that you need? And, and what about this that's going on? And, and what about, and you're going to be tempted. And somehow that lie, that anxiety, that pressure will try to make you think that if you didn't spend that day petitioning God, and if you just said, I'm just going to worship God all day, like as if God can't take care of what's going on. But just say no. Because, I mean, I pray in the shower. I pray when I'm driving. Most of my time I'm spending praying, I'm praying in tongues. I'm just saying, Lord, well, what does this word say? Or I'm meditating and I'm speaking scripture. Or I'll give, Lord, I give the care of my husband to you. I give the care of my daughter to you. Father, she needs this. Lord, I just thank you. You're right there with them. God, help me. I need wisdom. Prayers like that. But most of my time is spent worshiping. Lord, thank you. You're good. Most of my time is spent just giving God his word. Lord, I thank you that your word says this. You're so good. You're the only one true living God. Thank you, Father. You're moving. You're causing good. I just worship you, Lord. And I doesn't mean fear and worry. You're not trying to come in my head. I refuse to worry. No, Lord, you said don't worry. You said don't let my heart be troubled. Heart, peace, be still. You're not going to be troubled. God is with me and me. He's helping me. And I have to fight against that temptation of fear, of worry, of anxiety, of wanting to, you know, not trust God. We all do. And the more you do that, the more you start acting on that, the more you're going to find yourself just communing with him throughout the day. Lord, I love you. You're just going to have times you're just going to go, Lord, I love you. You're so good. Right? So, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is alive and living. And we choose to allow our minds to be renewed. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're our teacher and you're helping us. I thank you for everyone watching live stream who will watch this teaching, for those ladies who are here, that they will not let their minds shut off and stop them from receiving the truth of your word, that they will allow their minds to be renewed, that repenting will take place, meaning a decision to change the way I'm thinking. So we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you for listening and being here. We're back open for Bible study, ladies. You can come on in the sanctuary and be a part with us. 10 o'clock is live streaming. We open at 930 and we end at 12. Bye.